there. So if we have the first talk given by Rodrigo uh, Securia de Souza uh, from University of Sheffield, and he is going to talk about foot sim, uh, modeling tactile responses from the sole of the foot. It's all over to you. So yeah, hello there. As, a, as I was kindly introduced by Adele, my name is Rodrigo. I work at the University of Sheffield as a research associate. And uh, today we're gonna to be talking about the tactile responses of the foot sole. But uh, why are those tactile responses important? Well, they're important mostly for gait and for balance. So when we have a normal subject on an experiment walking and we use an aesthetics on their foot so like we can see on those plots over here, the velocity of gait, which is the y-axis of the plot, gets significantly reduced, as you can see at the gray bar in opposition to the black bar, when you anesthetize the foot. The opposite is also true. If you have patients with a suffered stroke or they have diabetes, if you put the vibrating insoles on their uh, shoes, you will really reduce the postural sway that you have on those conditions. So the tactile feedback from the foot sole is very important for walking and gait. But where does it come from? Where does information come from? Well, most of this information that we have for tactile afferents came from the hand, but we have four classes of tactile afferents. They are basically divided in how fast or slow they adapt to stimuli. So you have slow adapting and rapid adapting, and you have types one and types two, depending on the size of the receptive fields. So small receptive fields type one, large receptive fields type two. So you can see on this color image here, the layers of the skin, the epidermis and the dermis, and where those receptors are placed. You have the Pacinia corpsos, which are the RA2s over here, and uh, the Messina corpsos, which are the RA1s, which are thought to be the ones that have most uh, importance for tactile feedback on the foot. So, but how do you study those afferents? Well, one way is to use microneurography, like our collaborators Leah Bent and Nick did on uh, Guelph University. They got participants to sit on and get uh, electrodes implanted on their nerve. And then they recorded one afferent at a time. It's actually a very hard to do technique. It takes time, the patient, had, the subject has to be mobilized. And then they applied a range of amplitudes and frequencies of stimulation to the sole of the foot, or a range that you would have in normal conditions like walk from 0 0.0 millimeters to two millimeters and frequencies ranging from three Hertz to two fifth Hertz. And then they recorded this data set. So using that data, we built a model that takes into consideration the specific skin mechanics of, uh, of the foot and deliver pressures to a quasi-static model of the skin that then is given to integrating fire neurons that have 12 parameters that you can interchange, a low pass filter, all of those two to seven are time varying uh, parameters. And then you integrate all of those into a saturation parameter because of the adaptation of those uh, tactile afferents then you have a couple more post inhibition uh, parameters to account for refractoriness of the receptors. Also, as I mentioned, the skin of the foot is not like the skin of the hand. It's not homogeneous. So you have, as you can see on this uh, blue and green foot so plots, you have harder regions, which are the darker colors, and softer regions, which are the lighter colors. The same goes for thicker regions and thinner regions. So the heel is always the harder and thicker region versus the archer, which is softer and thinner. Also, the density of each one of those afferents varies in the, varies in the skin. And uh, this data also came from the microneurography study. So you have the density for each one of those afferent classes. So then we put the model to the test. Is our model firing the way those afferents were firing in the microneurography study in the empirical one. So in this plot, you have on the y-axis the way our model fired for the combinations of amplitudes and frequencies that they did also on the empirical experiment. 
and on the x-axis you have the firing of the experiment experiment per se so you can see that for the fa's the top ones the blue and the orange ones as you can see in the legend we are pretty much in the ballpark of what they should be the assays are not so good the reason for that being that for sa choose we only had very few models to use to optimize the parameters on the fitting procedure that we did use in differential evolution and also our model doesn't account for stretch as well and that's the main uh, thing that SHUs are known for one off. So putting that to the test, we also went to the thresholds, different firing thresholds, which are the minimum amplitude per frequency that at least a certain firing rate, a certain number of spikes. So here you have on the y-axis the amplitude and on the x-axis the frequencies of each one of the models, which are the individual lines and the thresholds, top four panels on the model bottom four panels, the empirical ones. So they look quite similar. So we were pretty happy and oh yeah, the model is behaving like it should be. So let's clump those models, group them per class. So if we group those per class, you can see those two graphs in the left. In the left, they are panel A is the what came from the microneurography experiment. So we can see those thresholds there for each one of the classes, same color code as before. Panel B is our own uh, model. And then we look and said, oh, they look very similar. So we went and measured the RMSAs, which is a measure of difference in between those two curves. And if you look at, uh, at this graph on the right, you can see that the F phase zero there mean the curves are really similar. We are in the optimal scenario and one being the worst possible case that the F phase behave much better than the SAs and they are all in a good range. The scatter points are actually individual models over there. So it seems that everything is going well, that a model is behaving the same way that the reference on the actual foot of both subjects behaved. So we decided to go even further and put the, the model to the test. We had subjects uh, on the Insigno Institute done by our collaborator, Claudia, putting uh, sensorized insoles on their shoes which are basically pressure sensitive insoles that can get pressure off your feet when you're walking or when you're doing any activity. And then using those pressures, we converted those pressures into indentations. That's what our model use. Because as you remember, micronography can only be done with patients immobilized and one afferent at a time. So now we can take these pressures and turn them into indentations fit them back into the model and do experiments that would not be possible in that scenario. And then we found out of the bat that for all the phases of the step, like the initial contact, the flattening of the foot, the mid stance and the push off, you have different activations of each one of those different classes. So if you look at the bottom of the image, you have two foot soles uh, paired, the red ones, are the heat maps of the pressure sensitive insoles. So you can see how the pressure is distributed in each one of those parts of the step. The other foot, the one in black, is the activation of the actual neurons, the actual reference. And we can see that on the initial contact, there is a burst of FA2 uh, firing, which was something that was not known. Granted that it was a proof of concept experiment, it was not that well controlled, but uh, is a very, good indication that we can actually use the model to experiment in a way that wouldn't be possible using micronography. And then just to show you a small animation of that step happening, same as before, the heat map of the pressures on the left-hand side and the activation of the mechanoreceptors of tactile reference on the right-hand side. And you can see here again, the plot of those uh, firing rates per time. And you can see the bursts in FA2 firing in the initial phases of it. And then this model is already being applied to prosthetic development by our collaborators on ATH, uh, ATH Zurich, uh, Natalia and Stani. So they are doing the work over of nature a while back. They are doing real feedback prosthetics by having uh, sensorized insoles, giving uh, stimulus to the nerve by using implants. And then using the things that we are optimizing in our model, we aim on giving actual a good uh, account of what the sensation would be 
for each one of those tactile afferents in the foot so and restore the sensation on those uh, subjects. So that's basically it. This is the team, Hannes, myself, and uh, Luke and Claudia worked on the, the insoles, the guys on the ATH, Natalia and Stanie, and uh, Nicolas and Leia that did the microneurography experiments. So uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, you can fire in questions you want. Okay, okay, so that's great. So uh, thank you, that was perfectly on time. And uh, um, yeah, so please, uh, ask any questions by typing them into Q&A box. Um, so anyone who has questions, panelists or the audience, please type this into Q&A box. Um, while people are thinking about it, maybe I could, I could start. Uh, so uh, I, I probably I missed it. So what was these, uh, the, so you had four different FA1, FA2, SA1, and SA2. So these are four. So what, what they were, how they were different from each other? So what so they're yeah, measuring? So we, we got the, the data from the microneurography experiments. And then our yeah. model has the integrating fire neurons with 12 parameters. So we applied differential evolution to those models to try to fit them to the firing or if to each one of the afferents that were recorded in the experimental setting. So basically the same number of afferents that they recorded, we have it as models. So the total was about F52 models divided per class, a certain number of them in okay. each of the classes. And then that's why we just, I just showed you a representative image, otherwise I would show you a massive scatter plot full of information. Yeah. And of then, uh, then I, I clumped them into classes. That's why you only saw four classes, but those four classes actually came. And how do you do that? Did you run uh, some sort of a dimension reduction or? Sorry, I didn't catch that. So, so how did you do that? So you you said you had a, quite a lot of uh, different, you know, bunch of things. Uh, yeah, and from this, you pull this out. So how do you do that? So we, have the, we had the firing rates for those experiments. So we knew yeah. that amplitude two and frequency three hertz elicited 50 uh, hertz firing rate. Mm. So we had the responses of those afferents and then we throw them into a machine learning differential evolution algorithm to basically tell me which combination of the parameters on that uh, differential equation, which okay. is the, the leak and fire model, would provide me with a response that was closer to the actual uh, empirical one. That's, uh, that's how we did it. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so that's great. Um, uh, so, okay, so I think we are going on time. So thanks a lot, Rodrigo, again. It awesome. was great you talk. Much. You're welcome. And so next, uh, we should crack on.